becoming a practice these days. Uh, in front of the laptop, in front of the camera, uh, we are welcoming our distinguished speakers. Today have, we have with us Dr. Monomita Nondi from Brunel Business School, uh, Brunel University of London. And we have Dr. Krishanu Pradhan from Madras Institute of Development Studies. Uh, in, this, is a, this is a webinar, international webinar, which is being organized by the Department of Economics uh, and ICAC of Vijay Krishna Girls College, Howrah. In collaboration with uh, the Department of Economics uh, of Ramakrishna Mission, Vidya Mandir, Belur, I also would like to welcome Dr. Dev Kumar Chakraborty, uh, head of the Department of Economics of Belur. Uh, and I'd like to uh, express my heartfelt thanks to the principal of uh, Vidya Mandir for allowing us this collaboration. Uh, having a, a well, I, and I, I must, I should always welcome uh, the, all the participants who have uh, heartily joined in this, registered for this webinar. Uh, I, I definitely know that they are going to have a wonderful session today, <clears throat> listening to our distinguished speakers. Uh, it, it is definitely, we all, we all know that it is a very, very critical time that we are going through uh, at this moment. A critical time because uh, we have to make some very tough choices. Choice between uh, our a safe life and uh, a means of living. And choice is something that economics is always, we first learn in economics in our first class, we learn that economics is because is all about choices. So now we are making choices of between two very un, uh, unusual, uh, um, I, I would say, uh, factors that are influencing our lives uh, in every way possible all throughout the world. So this choice is between whether we can we would be we can avoid the uh, this uh, killer disease, a uh, terrible disease. I would not I should not call it a killer disease, but it is it is a, a horrible terrible disease that is engulfing the entire world. And uh, if if we pay, if we choose to be safe, then we lose on the other alternative that we have in uh, with us. That is the means of living. How do we earn our bread? So if we choose to earn our bread, then we do not have uh, 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 we we have we have the risk rather I would say of uh, being exposed to this disease. So that's a tough choice that uh, we have to make as individuals. That uh, that's a tough tough choice that everyone has to make these days, the uh, the country as a whole, the world as a whole. So uh, standing at this point, uh, we can see that um, as uh, as uh, Rupkotha said right at the beginning, in the new normal situation, lots of uh, new equations are coming into vogue. Different kinds of equations at different levels, both at political and at the economy level. We are seeing different types of equations emerging uh, and uh, everyone is striving to exist and assert, I would say. So in this process, uh, where does India stand? Uh, that is what we are going to uh, learn today about. Especially, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to mention here Something that uh, the India's external affairs minister, Dr. S. Joy Shankar, uh, stated recently um, that uh, he says that the era of risk averse passivity has receded, giving rise to expectations of greater realism backed by political will. So uh, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, tells us that there is a uh, the blocks are setting in a different pattern. All the blocks are now changing and setting a different pattern. And India is trying to uh, uh, build up a momentum to for a multipolar world with a multipolar Asia at its core. 
so this is this is a power play there is a power play at the political level that is going on uh, india is trying to uh, uh, you know india's uh, i would say balancing posture it's uh, uh, increasing military activity and uh, strategic capabilities actually uh, is bringing india giving india some uh, sort of um, i would say uh, leverage and uh, in fact in fact i would like to mention here that before this pandemic had set in uh, early uh, at the end of 2019 mm-hmm. uh, there was a perception that india uh, india uh, is going to become the world's third largest economy right after usa and china uh, even at a nominal gdp growth rate if i remember correctly it was 8% something It's between 7 and 8% they uh, predicted that india would Uh, actually um, cross germany in 5 years and japan in 7 years so that was uh, kind of a very strong prediction that uh, uh, and we were feeling very happy about it but then came the pandemic and then everything started to move in uh, in you know i wouldn't say different way i would say everything started to moving at a very very unknown way so uh, under the circumstances right at this moment we find um, that uh, our biggest challenge is china our biggest challenge is china and uh, china is one country uh, that um, uh, we are unlikely to see china giving in uh, even a little bit of strategic space to india so uh, i would not call uh, i would not say that china is becoming the, uh, becoming an enemy i would rather say that china is becoming a very strong adversary and uh, we have and uh, for india it is going to be a very challenging uh, effort to keep up with china and to maintain a balance in the coming months and years on the, uh, this is this is just and also india is facing a lot of trouble along all its Indi- international borders so politically the equations are once again they need to be uh, uh, you know reset uh, so that that is that these are the very big challenges or rather the turbulences that india is facing along its international border needs to be settled uh, in uh, in a way so that india emerges with a, a higher score i would say higher score on the business side i would uh, like to uh, point out that india at, at this moment standing now would like would should should uh, focus on two things concentrate on two things and uh, one is that in, increase india's attractiveness to foreign customers uh, that is increase demand for its products and uh, another would be to prepare indian uh, companies to effectively service this demand uh uh this this is something this is something that uh, we need uh, i feel that right now india needs to build up uh, as everyone is saying brand india brand india to build up a brand india there has to be some effort that has to be given by the country in building up the credibility credibility uh, for example you need to uh, prove to the world that there is value for money Uh, for india and that uh, it is uh, i would say for example tourist friendly uh, so that uh, and you know uh, you have to manage the you have to manage the operational risk in such a manner that you become acceptable to the world uh, as a whole that india is really a safe place a place credible place where people for, uh, even uh, for tourism they can come for investment they can come so that is one part i would like to point out secondly uh i would also like to uh, say that india also needs to find out the largest and the most lucrative uh, markets for services market specific services of these countries should be uh, attra- should be uh, targeted uh and then again uh, there has to be some improvement in this service sector also there, there we have to identify what are the areas of dissatisfaction why is uh, thailand doing much better in tourism than us or why is uh, indonesia doing much better than us why not india because india has a tremendous potential in terms of tourism we have not even tapped 50% of that 
potential. So this is just, I'm just citing an example. That That's just an example. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, I would like to say, this is finally, I'd like to make this point, is that we need to align education and vocational training with market demand. For uh, map the demand for professionals today and in the future in specific areas with specific skill requirements. This is, I believe, as an academician, this is something uh, we have been perceiving for the last uh, few years that, uh, you know, you find uh, this uh, knack asking you questions about how, what is your uh, program outcome, what is your course outcome, what is your, how, what are you, what are you students doing, what is the, give us the data, that, how the students are faring in life after they qualify from your institute. So, so there has to be, we need to align education and vocational training with the market demand and, you know, maybe take some uh, bold steps and formulate some new policies in this new era. Having said this, I will. I'm. I'm now just going to start listening to my. I need. Uh, I think we are all eager to listen to our very distinguished speakers. And thank you. And I. I know that this webinar is going to be a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. We got from your speech a uh, gist of the overall scenario nowadays right from beginning to the economic scenario to the uh, problems of NAC that we have to face. Uh, anyway, uh, next I will request Dr. Sheta Guho, coordinator of IQAC, Tejar Krishna Girls College, to say a few words. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of IQAC, I welcome all our participants, estimates, esteemed uh, speakers, students, and my colleagues to today's international webinar. Due to first spread of COVID-19, uh, we are somehow in a dilemma between uh, extending lockdown and uh, ensuring, the, uh, ensuring that economy does not uh, collapse. On the one hand, we have to save our lives. And on the other hand, uh, we have to see that people do not die of hunger. So the challenge is quite unique uh, as uh, huge damage has already been inflicted. So let's see um, what our economists say today. Uh, and thank you, Department of Economics, uh, for arranging this uh, seminar today uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Ramkrishna Mission Bidda Mundir Belu. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Dev Kumar Chakraborty, HOD Department of Economics, for your constant support and cooperation. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And all the best to the department and the conveners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guho. So now we will move on to our main session. Our first speaker today is Dr. Monomita Nondi, and she will speak on sustainable business. Dr. Monomita Nondi is a reader in accounting and finance at Brunel Business School. She completed her PhD from the University of Calcutta, India, and a second doctoral degree from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Italy. She worked as visiting research fellow at Lally Business School, New York, and Radboud University, Holland. Before joining Brunel University, she taught at different universities in India and Surrey University, UK, where she got awarded for her innovative and technology-led teaching. She is interested in interdisciplinary research and technological advancement in emerging issues in corporate finance and banking. Her research works have been published in international peer reviewed journals, and she regularly presents her work at leading conferences. She is the co chair of Southeast Group of British Accounting and Finance Association and acts as an expert at PMI of the European Accounting Association. 
Her research attracted external funding and her collaboration with business allowed the firms to take progressive strategic decision. Welcome, Dr. Nandi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rupkatha. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, though it's morning here in London. So uh, I'm very pleased and thankful to uh, my good friends who invited me uh, for this talk. And uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Ruma Bhattacharya, who also sent me the invitation. And I would like to thank all the organizing uh, committee, people in the organizing committee and all the participants for taking time to uh, share their thoughts uh, with us and giving us the opportunity to share our thought uh, and what we think uh, about Indian business and how we, the academicians, can contribute for the development of the uh, business and for the recovery of the economy uh, very quickly. So uh, first I would like to share my screen uh, where I prepared very uh, few slides because I prefer uh, to talk through all the points. Let me first open my slide, sorry about that. So hopefully all of you can see my slides. Can you see the slides? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, as uh, your uh, colleague described, uh, like what kind of activities I do in my research, I'm very keen in doing interdisciplinary research where I want to work with uh, companies and uh, I also work with small and medium businesses uh, who contributes a lot to the economy and also uh, how to link the students and um, how to link our knowledge and skills with the required um, knowledge for the business. So um, and in all those activities, we mainly try to find out that how we can uh, work with the companies to understand their problems and how to develop, um, uh, help in their development and how we can help the students, the next generation to get well-trained for the um, future business. So it is very important. So uh, depending on the current situation, I would say it is really important for us to keep hope. Uh, and hope is something that if you keep on holding on, on the pain till ends, uh, so you can see a good future. So I'm not saying that the situation is easy, we all knew the situation is very, very difficult. And we really need to understand how we can quickly recover from these uh, problems and how we can help each other to move forward. So uh, when we are talking about sustainable business, so what does it mean actually? So we have to think about a business model. Uh, we, the researchers, we, the people in academia, we can work with the business to develop a sustainable business model so that whatever happens in future, uh, that the business can survive for long. If I could kindly request all of you to mute your microphones because otherwise there would be lots of echoes. Thank you. So uh, the main, main issue here is if we cannot work together on uh, different uh, models, existing model and try to identify what are the main problems and how to overcome those problems, that's really important. Now you might be thinking that uh, you are listening to so many speakers uh, in different webinars. So what we actually need to do now, how long we will keep on thinking. Shall we start now? Yes, this is the right time to start now. And as we all are uh, mostly working from home, this is the right time we can collaborate with each other. We can ask the business what they really want and what are their problems. And uh, they might be of different size, they belong to different sectors. So we have to understand how we can help them uh, with our existing knowledge and how we can 
can expand our existing knowledge and skills to help them to um, survive in this difficult time. And not only in this difficult time, that if anything happens in future, they can continue their business. That is really important. And the main point is that until now, most of the business models were not sustainable. So what happened when this uh, crisis came in, when there were changes in the normal uh, way of dealing in business, then um, all the economies started failing. So uh, most of the economies, so, so that uh, we can see that IMF is predicting there would be uh, a fall in the GDP worldwide around uh, 4.9 or 5%. So which is a really scary thing for all of us. So we need to think that this is a good learning for us and we have to learn how to expand our um, knowledge base and how we can do great things now so that in future, if something goes wrong, we can uh, not only recover now uh, very soon, but in future we can uh, sustainably do our business. Now, when we talk about sustainability, I found that people are quite con like confused about the term sustainable development. So the World Commission on Environment and Development they explained it very easily where it says that uh, meets the needs of the present without comprise, uh, compromising the ability, uh, comprising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. So we have to do something now. So uh, with, without uh, any any uh, compromising activities for the future generation. So we are not uh, sacrificing something for the future. We are doing something now for the betterment of the uh, future generation. So now the next question is how the business could contribute. So what would be the contribution from the business? Business plays an important role in the economy because if you think that you don't have money to buy your food, you don't have a place to live, so you don't need, you cannot fulfill your basic needs. So then you cannot think about education, you can't think about development of the whole economy. So uh, economy, money generation, uh, proper development in the economy so that all the resources are equally shared among us and all of us get equal opportunities, these things are really important. And business is not for one day task uh, it, they, to develop a business. They need lots of resources, lots of time. And not only that, they, to survive in long run, they have to find out a model because every business is perpetual. So they are established for long term. They are not established for to do certain things for certain time. Uh, so, the businesses need to find out a, a way of doing sustainable business. And here comes the importance of the researchers, the students, we, the uh, people in the society, the households, how we can uh, contribute uh, in their planning process and how we can contribute in the success story of the business. The main thing is the triple bottom line. So when the business are developing their sustainable model, they have to think about the economy, they have to think about the society, they have to think about the environment. Without thinking all those things together and only thinking about profit making will not help any business to sustain for a long time. Because if you think when you are going for buying food items, you, you might be thinking, shall I buy this food? Because this food might contain lots of fat elements or this is less, there is less energy. So this is not good for my health. And uh, I have to find out some good, like we are very keen in buying organic food. And to buy organic food, why we are willing to pay more money? Because we knew that that's good for our health, good for our well-being. So if we are um, okay with our health issues, if we are doing well with our day-to-day um, -day life, then we can think about other things in our life. So we need to think, the business needs to think about the economy, definitely along with their profit. They need to take care of the society uh, to a great extent, and they have to take care of the environment. So if they cannot take care of all those three elements, then the model is not that 
sustainable and they might make huge profit for some time, but they cannot sustain for a long time. So sustainable uh, development means that they all the businesses, the people in the society needs to do loads of things that um, will help the society to survive now and it will try to create a, a good future uh, for our future generation. Like we all are quite aware of the sustainable goals developed by UN. Now, I, I'm not showing uh, what are those goals are. I'm trying to focus more on certain types of uh, things that the Indian business could focus on. Now, the first thing is uh, renewable energy. resources in India, which we can use for manufacturing and production. But um, the question is, the question is, uh, are we able to keep on doing the same thing for year after year? So we have to find out a way where we can use the natural resources in such a way that we can keep on using for a long time. And um, these days, there are different uh, factors that could, uh, different materials uh, that we can use for a certain time. And after that, um, they will start creating pollution in our environment and they are not um, that useful in long, long run. So if you think about the energy that we can de develop from wind, so when the art is there, wind will be there. So we can keep on producing energy by using wind and um, that could be renewable resources for us. And India is doing really good in renewable resources. And uh, because I have seen in Tamil Nadu that they have so many windmills, uh, in, like miles after miles, I have seen that they have windmills um, around, uh, beside the road, uh, road, main road. And uh, so there are opportunities. Now, what other things we have to do? We have to be more innovative. We have to link with the business that what are the main problems and how we can help them Along with that, we have to also think about what are the main problems um, with the policymakers, why they are not happy to establish a new policy, how we can use the um, uh, advanced technology to advance in these renewable resources. So these are the areas that we have to highlight. And we, the researchers, we, the people from economics and business background, we can come forward. And the student plays an important role here. The student can identify a particular area and then they say do a project on that. And they come up with a solution with their existing knowledge and they can um, help the businesses to apply those knowledge and um, with the help of their teacher, they can uh, establish new projects. And that could be like, if you are establishing a very big business, you need very small parts um, to build up that big business. And these uh, small businesses can, which are contributing a lot more than 95% of the whole economy, they, 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 the students can develop these small businesses and which can be part of the big business. So in that way, every unit of the economy is uh, getting developed because uh, the students are the small individuals who can develop small businesses or do consulting. And by doing all those activities, they are earning their living. And not only that, they are helping the big businesses to grow very fast. So uh, sustainable energy is one of the ways that we can think ahead of and uh, think ahead and uh, we can think how, how we can explain those things in, in for uh, better for the future generation. Then the question is about equality. So these days we are seeing that lots of um, rallies and lots of uh, protest is going around uh, Black Lives Matters. Yeah, definitely. So, um, everyone should get equal opportunity. And if you think carefully that this is a girls college, but uh, um, here we ha uh, you, you have people, uh, male, uh, male colleagues, you have female colleagues, you have um, other uh, male, female uh, colleagues doing administrative work. So all together, you are making it a success. So alone we cannot do it. And we have to give equal opportunity to everyone in this society. 
And it's not only black or white or the color differences, the gender differences, the age differences, we have to reduce those gaps. And if everyone is happy that if a male colleague is earning similar uh, salary like a female colleague, then all are happy in this situation. And if you're not happy, you cannot contribute a lot for the economy. So to contribute a lot for the economy, you need to be happy in your own life. And uh, this equality issue is very important. This is one of the sustainable goals. And uh, you can see that previously the accounting profession was highly dominated by uh, male and there were very few female um, colleagues. And the, uh, but later on it started changing because the uh, gender structure in the higher education started changing. Many girls started coming in education and getting higher education helped them to uh, move uh, towards the job market and get a good job. And they started learning how to balance their work life and professional life. And we all are doing all those things in our day-to-day -day life. So it is really important to understand how you create equality among uh, in this society and every business and now we, we saw those news that the countries which got female leaders uh, they performed really well during co coronavirus crisis and um, so I would not say that it is just because they were having female leaders but there are different research um, where uh, people show that if uh, we got more uh, female leaders in the board or if we got um, female directors, they are quite conservative. They knew how to uh, plow back their profits uh, to a great extent so that if something goes wrong in future, they can take out the uh, money from there to invest in the business, which is not that common with the um, with men. They, they prefer to spend more when they earn more. So there are different um, research work uh, which support that. But at the end, every research work is saying one thing, that there should be an equality. So this is really important for the business to understand that how they could uh, develop this culture or how the Indian business can do work more on the equality, on the board equality um, in practice, and then they can um, start seeing a good future then uh, we have to start using technology. And India is so good in um, developing good technologies. Like India is the second largest uh, economy to manufacture mobile phones. And there are more than 1.3 billion people uh, in India. And the workforce is um, like, Workforce means uh, average age is 35 years, and we have more than half of the Indian population belongs to that workforce. And so we got good opportunities there. And though there are certain uh, infrastructural problems, like um, there is no proper infrastructure to establish uh, new connections or internet connections and this, that, but it is common everywhere. It's not only India. And if you think about, as Principal Madam was talking about China, and we will hear from another uh, colleagues of ours uh, who will talk about uh, India-China trade, we the India uh, China did so well on different uh, situation like if you go to um, any um, McDonald or any fast food center, you would see that they are doing the face identification. Then the question is, do we have enough security, uh, internet security? So this is the place where the researchers should play an important role. Like if we are keen in developing um, technology and with the help of technology, we can um, see advancement in education, in manufacturing everywhere and uh, service sector, then we have to create the protection mechanism also and we need to make it very strong and um, 
and we also need to think in India that many people are not educated, but if we give them internet to use, they might not understand the data protection and other things. They might not be able to read all the terms and conditions before they use internet. So we have to make, um, we have to find ways of um, uh, doing things very easily. And we have to find out user-friendly technologies, not very complicated technology that you have to download this app, you can protect yourself, and then the, you have to install those antiviruses. It's very hard to make people understand those things if they don't know the basics. And um, here also in, in developed markets, we have seen that there are many volunteers who are helping the elderly people to understand how to do remote banking. And these are the projects that students can do that if you identify that you were talking about NAC accreditation where they want people to uh, work with um, industry. So yes, <clears throat> You can uh, where you can work with the industry very well with the help of the students. The students can uh, say identify a area an area where they found that there is a high percentage of elderly people residing in this area, and for them they can uh, develop certain technologies and uh, they can help them to train uh, how to use those technologies for the development of their uh, own life and uh, how they can use that for their health, their well-being and um, different other activities. Like you can use uh, the AI enhanced uh, system to prepare a cup of coffee or a cup of tea for you. So if you can, if the students who are very well aware of those recent changes, they can help the people in the society to work on uh, these different types of um, topics. So there is a possibility that the business can work with students, with faculties, with academics and researchers for the development of their own business as well as for the development of the whole society. So. Very recently, uh, that West Bengal uh, suffered badly from um, this Amphan Typhoon. And uh, these days, I was watching the news yesterday that in Delhi, uh, the, the a bus was stuck under the um, bridge and there is heavy rain. And here also we found that people are saying this time the winter would be one of the bad winters um, because um, there would be lack of rainfalls and other things and the temperature will go um, go up a lot so it is not good for agriculture it's not good for anyone so uh, if you think about the wild um, fire, the fire in Australia, which literally stopped the life for a long time and um, lack of rainfall, then uh, typhoons um, and those type of climate change issues. So these are really important aspects to think that are we converting or are we shifting our attention from those climate issues um, towards the coronavirus issue only. Now, uh, I, I, I think uh, I read in many places that people are saying how the coronavirus uh, started uh, and um, how it became a pandemic. Then people are saying that uh, animals, uh, the, the virus, a group of researchers from Oxford, I believe, they said that the virus was already there. So it's not new, it didn't created by anyone or it's not lab created or it came from anywhere. But uh, I, I think the main concern was that um, it was there, but it was not getting that particular environment to be that serious. And uh, when um, the things started changing, especially in the weight animal market, where um, things became very difficult and they got an environment or in some other country where they got that environment, they started becoming very dangerous and um, it started transmitting from people to people. And it, it was um, uh, like creating lots of problem in everyone's life around the world. So it is very important to understand that 
uh, why why uh, how the business could help in doing all the um, like helping the environment to be a safe environment a good environment for agriculture good environment for everyone like uh, we these days we are talking about circular economy i will not talk about that a lot because i can talk for ages on that so we have to think that if we are wasting something, can we recycle that and then make it uh, use that product again for production or for our day to day lives? And um, so I have seen very recently that people are talking about changing uh, changes in uh, transportation of goods. So we have to make it more user friendly. So um, what they are doing that instead of putting a big um, box or wooden box or big uh, cardboard box, they are putting a recycle, uh, recyclable um, flips or pack. Um, so you can tear it off, you can pull it down and the whole thing will come out from these two uh, covers and these two covers are recyclable so you can recycle them for other purposes and you are getting your products especially the food item or perishable goods so you can still use them nicely and uh, the rest packing you are not throwing it away in the bin uh, you can use that um, uh, you can put it in the recycle bin and then it can be used for other purposes so then uh, I, I like this picture. I knew that it is uh, very difficult to think about that um, camping house or this type of houses these days because um, we all are staying at home. But uh, the beautiful thing of this is you can see uh, some solar panels here. So if we can think about uh, a house where we can put the solar panels, like in India, I. I, I spoke with many um, developers, um, building developers, and they said, oh, it would be really costly. But it, even if it is really costly, if you can uh, make people understand that if you spend this money, it, it is worth it to spend. And in spending this, you are helping yourself um, and you are helping the society. So the business, if, if they take the initiative, how to develop more um, uh, sustainable houses. Uh, so they can put solar panels. And if you can see this picture that in the front side, um, they got a glass. So you, you can use many products instead of using electricity, you can use the sunlight. And in India, most of the time we got um, hot and humid weather. So if you can use the sunlight to uh, boil water, if you can use the sunlight uh, for clocks, and if you can use the sunlight for solar lights to decorate your house, like we also use here, uh, even the weather is not that good, but still we use solar lights in our garden. So you can use this type of things to decorate your house and you, you, you are saving a lot and you are not saving your own money only, you are also doing good for the society. Society. And by doing that, you are helping the business to do good things to save the environment. Again, I'm going back to that triple line concept. And you are saving the environment, uh, helping the business to save the environment. You are helping the business to work for the development of the society. And all together, you all are um, doing excellent things. By doing that, you are helping the economy to grow. And in, if you think carefully, like during this uh, COVID time in India, we were talking a lot about the um, daily wage workers and uh, some of them might be staying in uh, a very uh, bad conditions. And if we can take the initiative, if the students, if the researchers, academicians, they can take the initiative to help the people in village area to develop this type of house. I'm not saying with solar panel, but we, we need to do innovative, uh, we need to find out how innovatively we can do that and innovative ways of doing it. And we can establish innovation hub in the university colleges where we can work together with the business. And then we can see that how well we can do that for the whole society. And uh, I, I can tell you one thing here that once I started this project, I didn't 
there and it was um on india that uh, how we, we all knew that in remote village area we got angarwadi um the social workers uh, who are not that uh, highly educated but they work for the society and uh, then we were trying to establish a cloud system that sitting here in London, I can see that, okay, in that village, they need more fasted items. And um, then we can arrange, we should have a, a proper supply chain um, model working there. And we might have people uh, in the cities who can um, send those products uh, and they can store that in some place and they can use the advanced technology to uh, for the first delivery of those items because if we take help from amazon or other big companies they are doing uh, deliveries in remote area so these are the models which are quite sustainable so i'm i don't think that i'm going away from sustainable model i'm focusing only on sustainable model so because there is no meaning if i'm a businessman why i will invest in this business when my business model is not sustainable then it is also important i know this this picture is very uh touchy picture and i i really first i shouldn't put this picture but i really hate uh, this picture and uh, then i thought that what we can do if if the companies are if the business are more careful about um, taking care of the animals and taking care of the species around the country so then they would not do this this is a small um a, a baby a baby elephant uh, and uh, who was used for performing certain tricks for the tourists in Thailand. And um, then, then the question is, um, the the um, elephant cub was not uh, given enough food or enough time uh, to live properly so this is inhuman activity and we we the business people should stop those things so if if i'm having a sustainable business model and i'm in tourism i would never ever give this type of contract to someone well, i don't want to hear it, sorry can you hear me can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, good. yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so if we if we stop, uh, if I'm a businessman and if I'm doing business in tourism, I would never give this type of contract to anyone that it would bring elephant to entertain my customers. And if businesses are taking this initiative of not giving then there would be less people doing all those bad things with the animals and species. So we have to take the um, uh, initiative. We have to teach them. So now the business can ask you, the researcher, the question that then how I can make money um, from my customers. Then we have, we the researchers, we the people from academia can um, give them some innovative ideas that instead of using this um, elephant, uh, how you can use technology, how you can uh, create 3D environment to uh, entertain your customer or how you by showing picture or showing some uh, good activities, funny activities by elephants uh, in the wild um, or, or uh, the wild nature of the wild animals, how you can entertain your um, customers. So we have to do take the initiative to do all this research to um, uh, provide knowledge to the business and help the business to prosper in future. Then one major problem is pollution by single use plastic. Today in the news, in the breakfast uh, in BBC, I was watching that um, these days the weather is getting better. And when the weather is getting better and people cannot uh, go abroad for a lot for their summer holiday, the schools are closed. So what they're doing, they're going to beach. And then going to beach means uh, doing picnic over there, spending a long day. That's really good. And that's required for our well-being. And, um, but then 
then they are throwing even PPAs um, on the beach and a group of people who are trying to clean the beach. And this is a voluntary organization. They keep on cleaning the beach because they think that's not good for the animals, uh, birds coming uh, near the seaside. So it is not at all a good practice by um, using the single use uh, plastic. If you are using that, bring it back with you. Uh, so if you are taking the picnic with you to spend a good day on, on the beach, then why can't you bring it back? So I would um, show you one uh, small uh, video here uh, and uh, it's, I will just play uh, a short video uh, for your understanding. And I really like this video. Hopefully it will play here. Our oceans sustain life. An abundant ocean can feed a billion people a healthy meal every day forever. But now they are being filled, killed by throwaway plastics. The equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic is dumped in the sea every minute. 17.6 billion pounds every year. Plastic is everywhere in our ocean, floating on the surface, mixing in the salt water, and sitting on the ocean bottom, miles and miles deep. And once in the ocean, it never goes away. Over hundreds of years, it breaks down into small pieces. But those pieces, even the tiny ones called microplastics, are still plastic. Sea turtles are choking on it. Scientists say that over 60% of whale and dolphin species are affected by it. Zooplankton, the base of the ocean food chain, eat it. And so do we. It's in the water we drink. It's in our food. Microplastics have been found in our salt, our honey, and our beer, and sometimes even in the air we breathe. Companies are choosing to make something that will be used just once from a material that lasts forever. If you don't like what throwaway plastics are already doing to our world, brace yourself. We face a tsunami of throwaway plastics in our and the ocean's future. Four times more plastic will be produced between now and the middle of the century than has been produced in all of history. Four times more. Yeah, so uh, th that's, that's a very big number, four times more than what was happening before. So uh, I, I think how the business can uh, help here, the business needs to think that if they are not producing, um, if they are not putting the products in a single use plan, if they are, um, instead of making small packs, if they are making one big pack, then there would be less uh, number of um, non-recyclable uh, materials um, which people can use. And uh, especially during this um, uh, coronavirus time, what we have seen that previously in uh, uh, shopping uh, centers, we used to get small uh, packs of different, say, um, chocolates or 16 chocolates in one bag or in one pack or cold drinks uh, small teens um, in uh, like eight teens or 16 teens coming together but because of lack of supplies uh, the business has started selling it separately and uh, I think that is one of the um, not not a good way of selling the product, and that um, help people to buy more small uh, contents uh, containers, and which they started throwing here and there. And these days, the main problem is with the PPE. And today in the news, I saw that they found lots of PPE uh, going down to the sea level, and um, especially the plastic gloves and uh, the mask. So it, the, these type of things, the business need to think carefully that how they can control the um, adverse impact of using plastics. 
and the main thing is our mental health and uh, this is also a sustainable goal like if if we are um, if we are using technology we need to understand that sometime we have to take a break from the technology and how we have to stop the use of the technology sometime and we have to interact with people and um, so these days uh, many businesses are developing apps so every time you are doing every work with app like um, we use our um, electricity meter, which we use through app. We do banking through app. We are doing mindfulness practices through app. We are doing exercises through app. So it, it, it is not that life. You have to think that beyond that, there is an app. And I think when we compare our business uh, strategies with Chinese business strategies, there is, the, there is a difference between that. If you go to China, you will see that from morning till late evening, that everything is done by phone and everyone is with their phone all the time. And even if you uh, need to order a food around 11 o'clock at night, you go to your mobile and within 15 minutes, the food will arrive. So people are uh, people stopped kind of interacting with other people and when you use more app there are more chances of uh, fraud more chances of uh, stealing and all those things so you have to simultaneously develop your own um, technology to support or to secure your uh, users um, of those technologies so it is very important that we have to think about our mental well-being and um, if someone is saying something don't refer them to go and use one app to do some mental exercises which will help them don't try with others start thinking that if you are in trouble you are saying i'm not feeling good and i'm asking you okay you are not feeling good don't listen to this talk go and use this app you will start feeling good it might work for you but it might not work for me so you have to understand that beyond this technological um, innovation technology is required in every business every sector we need technology but we have to learn how to use the technology and uh, these days I found a very good um, challenge going on on Facebook that I'm posting this. If you can read until end, then repost it. So um, people are trying their level best. So this is also a kind of business strategy that people will start using uh, more Facebook and they, they, the Facebook will get more users from different parts of the world. So it, it is really important to understand that how the business could do um, uh, take care of the mental well-being with their products and they can if they can do that they can take care of the society they can take care of the economy and the environment and there are certain legal requirements in India so we are not far behind China and we are doing really good we might be going slow but um, this every baby steps are taking care of many other things like Ministry of Corporate Affairs issued voluntary guidance on corporate social responsibility in 2009 so it is all almost um, 11 years gone and uh, then they uh, it was subsequently revised by the National Voluntary Guidance guidelines um, on the social environment and economic responsibilities of business in 2011. So the main purpose was, though there was a fun and impact of financial crisis was uh, going towards Asia and it was still in Asia, Asian market. So the main purpose of this regulation was you, the businesses should voluntarily start declaring and start um, talking about their responsibilities uh, towards the economy, society and environment. And in 2012, SEBI introduced this business responsibility report disclosure which are based on this UNGP principles and the UN Sustainable Development Goals that I was discussing until now. 
and uh, the business responsibility report this is important and uh, here here we the researchers can contribute a lot that we can help the businesses to uh, pro, uh, establish a good um, report and what are the what are the items they should include there and how people can understand that if i'm an investor how i would understand that if i'm a banker then whether i should give a good loan um, bank loan to the business or not depending on this business responsibility report because in one of our research long back we found that in us um, the companies who are getting good favorable terms and conditions of their loan um, they are doing really good in their social responsibility and if they are not doing sustainable business if they are not reporting it properly they are not getting a good terms in their loan uh, so and in india until 2019 i have seen that thousand companies more than thousand companies already started reporting on their responsibility issues so in a recent amendment in 2019 companies need to additionally de deposit the unspent amount in a separate account where, which they can use for their other environment and social and other activities which is really good and that should motivate one business should motivate other business to do the similar things uh, to show that see where when it is unspent, when you have excess, if you are doing sustainable business, you can generate excess money for your business. And section 166 defines the uh, fiduciary duties of the directors to work for the benefit of the company and promote the interest of the employees, community and environment. So um, the directors who are taking those decisions, they should be really keen to work for the employees, community and the environment. So it is really important for to follow the legal uh, regulations and uh, we have to identify those regulations though it is voluntary we have to make business aware that see if you do those voluntary de uh, declaration and do work for the society then you might be able to gain more profit so you can make a proper balance between your profit and non-profit activities and that will in general enhance your profitability um, or your profits of uh, profits of your company so this is good for your company now i will go back to the questions i have seen a couple of questions coming in and uh, when the next speaker is talking i will start typing my answers there so um, at the end, I would like to say that every crisis creates an opportunity. I'm not saying that there should be a crisis to create opportunity. So opportunities are there. And those crises um, kind of give us good lesson to understand how to utilize uh, this time. So, so when we are working from home, start talking. If you are students, start talking with your teacher to find out what type of innovative things you can do and you can like when we are too busy we cannot think about many things but when we are at home we are not rushing for work and other activities now it's a it is an ideal time for us to think how well i can help my society so say for example if you are staying in a local uh, place uh, if, if you are staying in a place where you have seen that there is no proper um, recycling uh, facilities so you can start thinking that can i talk to someone in the local council now people might say that oh okay there are lots of disturbances from the political parties and other this but i'm not getting into that without being involved with politics without being involved with other difficulties you if you are quite sure that um the way takul mashamiji they keep on saying that have faith on yourself if you don't have faith on yourself you cannot believe this that so you have to have immense faith on yourself that yes i can do it like if you bring a small plant and if you plant that um if you like take care of that plant which will be big after 10 years and that will create more greenery in your area or around your house no one is going to stop you so you don't need 
permission from political parties or you don't need permission from other uh, local authorities to um, plant some trees around your house. And you can, if you are buying, uh, like these days, most of you are used to in buying online. So if you go to Amazon or uh, Flipkart or anywhere, and uh, you, if you see that they are selling quite good solar lights and if you put that in beside your house that will keep your doorway uh, or, or your entrance quite um, colorful and uh, there would be lots of light no one is going to stop you so in this way you are actually helping that business to produce more of this type of product and at the same time, you are helping yourself, your society and your environment. So I think that this is the right time for all of us to start thinking how we can utilize our time to be um, more sustainable in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nongni. And it was an excellent presentation and it was really very lucid and wonderful. And it touched me such a lot. Thank um, you. Um, you, you. You said that you have gone through the questions and you are going to write the uh, type the answers in the chat box, uh, did you? Uh, uh, you can carry on with your, if you have already sorted out some uh, questions, you can start asking me and the rest I can, reply to them okay so uh, just let us uh, take a couple of questions so that everybody can listen to you and the rest uh, they can uh, just um, uh, look at the chat box and uh, find out right so just let me uh, uh, go, go through it um, uh, uh, it's from monomita sharkar Ma'am, at present, India is suffering the deep crisis of low demand and supply and low level equilibrium trap arises. How can we increase our effective demand in this situation? Okay, uh, thank you, Manamita. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, this, this is an important question that how we can increase um, the demand. And the way I was explaining that if you if you start thinking that I will um, go with the business who are producing sustainable products. So if you see uh, two companies, one is doing uh, developing some sustainable products like uh, solar lines. And if you are using uh, those solar lines for your own house, you can motivate your neighbors also, your friends also, to use the same thing. And in, by doing that, what you are doing, you are actually uh, bringing in um, the, uh, you are creating demand for this type of product. So that is um, one of the ways you can start creating demand. Then I was going through the manufacturing sector in India, there, there are lots of discussion going on around manufacturing sector. And uh, there, there is a report where they said that uh, there would be $1.4 billion uh, until 2022 um, invested only for electronic and hybrid uh, automobiles. And they are expecting that as there would be more uh, more people trying to commute by themselves, avoiding the crowded um, shared uh, public transport, there would be higher demand for two wheelers and three wheelers. So we have to think innovatively, and that is the place where the we the economists can start helping the business to create more demand of their product. And as your principal madam was saying that how we can create the international market, if we can talk with the local policymakers, if we can lobby and we can change the existing rules and regulations or modify them to make it user friendly and easier to adopt and easier to use, then that would be really good thing to enhance the demand and also uh, by 
by proper supply chain mechanism, we can increase the supply of those products. And we are still in a good place. We, uh, the Indian, uh, India is located in such a nice place that we can take advantage of many things. We got uh, mountain seas, everything. So we have different trade ports. So we can use those things to enhance our trade. Okay, uh, then uh, there's one question from Dr. Devjani Mitro. How can this problem be solved if the purchasing power is less? Then people will be able to purchase less. So what is the way out about the small purchase and restricting small packs? Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, thank you. But purchasing power is uh, definitely quite low in our country and if we compare with other countries like in China when every employee is getting uh, $28 per day whereas in India uh, every employee are getting $5 per day so we can understand the purchasing power is quite low now if we focus more on domestic product uh, like uh, um, Avian and other uh, schemes that's going on so if we start thinking uh, about not using uh, international products are uh, focusing more on domestic product. And if we can train ourselves, if we can make ourselves aware that how to use, how to enhance the quality of the local products and um, how innovatively we can compete with uh, external people. And instead of using uh, products developed in uh, Germany or other country, why can't we do that in our own country? If we start slowly it's not a very small task it's a very big task and the business needs to play an important role but if we can uh, give a sustainable model to the business to apply and they can attract more investors and by doing that if they can start producing the goods for their own people then we will start seeing that the money is not uh, accumulated in the hand of few people it is well distributed and that will enhance the purchasing power of each and every unit of the economy uh, okay so uh, there are other questions as well but i find some questions on india and china so uh, the next our next speaker will uh, talk on india and china trade relations so uh, i think we'll now uh, thank our first speaker Dr. Monomita Nundi, and go over to our second speaker. And ma'am, please, uh, if you can uh, type uh, the answers to the other questions, because we have to manage our time a bit also. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so we uh, move on to our uh, second speaker. Uh, our second speaker today is Dr. Krishna Pradhan. The topic of his session is India-China Trade Relations. Dr. Krishna Pradhan is an assistant professor in Madras Institute of Development. He has done his graduation in economics from the Dashnagar University in Singapore, and both his post graduation and his degrees are from Jadavpur University. He completed his PhD from Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore. His PhD thesis was highly commended. He has worked as research associate in a high business school. He also had teaching experience as an assistant professor in Symbiosis Economics, Pune, at the National Kunji Institute of Management Studies, Bangalore and also at the Chennai Mathematical Institute to pick up Madras Institute Development Study. The fields of specialization are finance, macroeconomics, kinematics, economic growth and mathematical economics. He has, to his credit, various articles published in both national and international journals and also in edited books. Has presented a number of research papers in various papers and conferences and also has acted as resources. I can't go the mic. 
Are you there? Yeah, but he's there. I think he's okay. Uh, he's, no, uh, no, he's, he's doing the presentation. Yeah, uh, yeah, he started the presentation. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Pradhan, you are. Please unmute your mic. I can't hear you. Dr. Pradhan, you are not audible. Dr. Pradhan, can you please unmute yourself? You are not audible. Hello? Yeah, yeah, no, you are not audible. You are not audible. No, I can. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, now we can hear you. Much. Can you uh, can you see my PPT also? Yeah, yes. 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 Uh, can you see my PPT? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can. It's to have okay. 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 Please carry on. <clears throat> uh, uh, very good. Good evening to all of you. Thank you, madam, for such a nice introduction. And I am actually from uh, Calcutta, so I am Bengali. Uh, so I should have the liberty to speak whatever way I feel in that sense. Anyway, I'll be trying to speak mostly in English. If any uh, any audience or students they want to uh, ask any question in any language, I'll be free to answer them. So the topic is India-China trade relations in today's context. So this is my uh, brief outline of this uh, talk or the presentation, the brief introduction and the background of the talk. In the comparability of uh, size of the Indian economy versus the Chinese economy, then India-China trade in last five six years, the size of India India-China export in the context of global market, then composition of India-China export and import, what are the major import export items between India-China takes place, and since export in import cannot be explained without bringing the investment in a destination country. So I'll be also talking about the Chinese investment in India, then Chinese business in India, then especially the uh, Chinese tech investment in India startup. And one of the India's most uh, remarkable success story of the liberalization, which is India's pharma sector. That also I'll, I'll explain and the role of Chinese import there. And one sector which most often overlooked or neglected is the growing importance of one-way tourism. That means only from India to China, not the, uh, not the China to India. So tourism also comes in the context of trade. <clears throat> now, all of you know that the uh, two countries started their journey of development more or less at the same time. We started since 1947 uh, and our plan economic development started from 1951. China started since 1949, soon after Mao owned the civil war in China. They are also planning system, planning development started since 1953. But till mid of the uh, mid 1970s, both countries were poor, but relatively India was better off than China, both in terms of uh, size of the economy as well as the per capita income. But soon after the death of Mao in middle of uh, seven, uh, 1970, that is 1976, the new leader, Deng Jinping, he took the leadership of Chinese Communist Party and he introduced massive economic reforms in China. So though these economic reforms was initially introduced in the early 80s, but its impact was felt in 90s when the worldwide liberalization, privatization and trade, uh, trade uh, enhancement took place through WTO. So even if you compare India-China, till 1987, India was ahead of China, both in terms of absolute GDP as well as the per capita income. But this trend did not continue after 91-92 when India had a major or massive macroeconomic crisis. After 93-94 onwards, every year China added more than $200 extra 
per capita income compared to India, and after 2000 income more than 2000, and after 2000 same amount of income every year additional 3000 dollar per capita they started adding to their income. So what are what are the success story of the transformation of China, which was a poorer country than India till early 80s or early 90s, but it became a global superpower. The first success story was the decollectivization of agriculture. In the opening of the economy to the foreign direct investment, which started only early 2000, the opening of economy to the foreign direct investment. Then allowing the entrepreneurship spirit in business, selling or renting out all state-owned PSU except banking and petroleum uh, sector PSU. They, India joined much early in WTO. China joined only in 2001. They deregulated all kinds of price control. They abolished state monopoly from most of the sectors. And these are the remarkable uh, economic reforms which Chinese said this is the Chinese way of socialism led by market. So Chinese way of socialism led by market in terms of decollectivization, deregulation, privatization, and uh, participating in global supply chain, global trade, WTO, etc., have contributed remarkably to the success of China. So such transformation has happened in the last 30 years. So uh, the, this has resulted in the transformation of the Chinese economy, which was poor to economic super power. 30 years, more than 30 years, the economy grew close to 10% per annum. As a consequence of this, there has been remarkable uh, reduction in poverty, malnutrition, large-scale urbanization, urban, uh, urban, the, the rural urbanization, literacy improvement, education, there's a massive improvement. India also followed the best step like China, but it was too late. And most of the reform steps in India are very small. That is why in policy domain, you get baby step reforms. These baby step reforms are essential because we have a democracy. No political party want to face the political backlash because of massive, uh, massive or large scale reform. So India also transformed its socialistic mixed economy to market led mixed economy, but at a very slow space. So in economic front, which are which are under uh, India is an underachiever country, but in social, political, and democratic space, India has made significant progress. The success of China, though, which came through mostly from uh, export and participation in global supply chain and value chain. And in international trade, we have, we have we, most of the time we have, we have understood that export led growth or trade as an engine of growth. China and most of the East Asian countries are the finest example of export led or Chinese led growth. This is where India has measurably failed. So in this context, we'll discuss the India-China trade relationship. So now coming to the look at the size of the the uh, Indian economy and the Chinese economy. Till, 90, uh, ni till 1991, Indian economy, both in uh, per capita and in absolute nominal GDP term, it was ahead of uh, China. But in today's context, Chinese economy is the second largest after USA in nominal GDP, the largest economy in GDP term, whereas India is the fifth largest economy, but size of the GDP is less than $3 trillion. So in that sense, Chinese economy is quite five times larger than Indian economy in, in uh, nominal terms. And in per capita terms, because of their one-child policy and relative stability of their population growth, their per capita income is around eight times higher than was their uh, average Chinese is eight times higher than uh, eight times higher than eight, eight times richer than the Indian citizen. So now uh, come to the uh, trade picture of last uh, five six years data. So there are uh, seven uh, column. The second column I have given it is India's export to China in billion rupee, and the bracketed figures are the percentage of GDP. So we barely export 1% of our GDP to the China, whereas we import more than 3% of GDP from China. As a consequence, on an average, the trade deficit with China is more than 2% of our GDP. And, and if you if you if you compare the overall India's export to China, barely 5% of India's export market is destined to China, whereas 15% of the country's India's import comes from China. And this has resulted in massive trade deficit. And 40% of country's trade deficit is on account of their trade deficit with China alone. So if we somehow can control this trade deficit by whatever means, I think India's current account deficit problem will be solved or at least will be reduced to less than 1% of GDP. 
so though we have a large trade deficits in our account uh, but we have uh, also voluminous surplus in our trade in intangibles so as a consequence of both our current account deficit has never exceeded 2 or 3 percent of gdp and uh, at in recent times it is it is close to 0.1 percent of gdp uh, this has happened because of massive decline in economy uh, massive slowdown of our economy and massive decline of our import not that india has achieved this low trade deficit or modest surplus in trade account and current account on account of any massive increase in export no it has been because of uh, strict restrictions of import and, and uh, slowdown of our economy so now uh, come to the size of the india china uh, export import market in the global context india's share in global export is barely 2% import is close to 3% so in that sense volume of trade as a percentage of gdp is less than 5% but if you come to china china export is around 14% of their gdp import is around 12% of gdp on an average 25% of world world uh, trade is contributed in china so that means it's a massive massive trade china is taking place with the rest of the world so <clears throat> that means india accounts for less than 5% of trade as i have said but china contributes one fourth of the global trade and remember since 1994 china has never experienced deficit in their trade balance as well as current account in recently only 2018 19 there is a modest modest deficit in their uh, current account this is on account of their strategic shift towards the domestic economy rather than uh, export dependent economy So now come to the share of export and import. Our share of export is only 12% of GDP. Our import is 18% of GDP. So in overall, less than 30% of our economy is integrated to the rest of the world. But uh, but if you come to China, though in recent times their share of uh, GDP uh, in export has declined, but before that, more than 30% of its GDP came from export, and more than 50% around. their uh, gdp was a volume of trade so 50% of chinese economy was integrated to the to the rest of the world and and remember also chinese export is so high the export is actually equal or uh, more or less equal to india's size of gdp so what india as a whole produce in a year is more or less equal to what china exports in a year so <clears throat> So considering this, now come to the uh, uh, what type of export and import takes place between China and India. As I have said, India's export share to China as a percentage of GDP is barely, barely, barely one percent, and import is around three three uh, percent. So five percent of India's export is also going to China, and fifteen percent import comes from uh, China to India. and in recent times the import has gone so much that from 2001 onwards if i calculate the total volume of import has increased by almost 50 times and it was highest in 70 billion dollar in 2018 19 and this has caused more than 40% of our trade deficit this has caused more than 40% of our overall trade deficit of india Now, what are the major Chinese export to India and major uh, India export to China? More or less, it is it is all all to known to all of you that India ex- imports mostly Chinese smartphone, electrical appliances, power plant inputs, all domestic uh, appliances also, fertilizer, auto components, finished steel, capital goods like solar power plant, telecom equ- equipment like 4G. Uh, 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 network optical fiber even the metro rail which we are importing from china we are not producing here iron and steel products one of the remarkable success of liberal as i was saying the pharmaceutical sector 70% of our pharmaceutical uh, inputs or ingredients come from china then chemicals plastics and engineering goods this 15 or 16 items which have said which are uh, coming from china they constitute 50% of india's import also remember 50% of india's import consists of this 15 or 16 items and what india export to china mostly they are the primary product india imports mostly manufacturing products and the capital goods but it imports only the primary products marine products tea coffee spices mineral frozen meats 
organic chemicals, chemicals, cotton, animal and vegetable oil, salt, sulfur, sulfur. These are very very primary uh, products. Organic chemicals, pearls, stones, precious metals, and surgical instruments. We are importing most of the pharmaceutical ingredients, but small small surgical instruments are exporting to China. Now, as I was saying, since China has a massive surplus in trade account with India, as well as current account surplus with India, it is evidently clear that country having a surplus both in current account and trade account will have a claim on the assets of the importing country, either in terms of higher uh, foreign exchange, uh, either in terms of drainaging higher foreign exchange reserves, or in terms of debt equity participation in the country. So, one of such avenues is foreign direct investment to India. It was, remember, it was less than uh, 0.31 billion dollars in 2011-12. It rose very steadily soon after the new government came to power, the, this present government came to power in 2014. It has been so high, it is almost around 5 billion dollars in 2019. And Chinese FDI, FDI has increased remarkably since 2019, consistently every year. However, this office, remember this official FDI figure uh, does not reflect the true extent of Chinese FDI to India. Maximum Chinese FDI are rooted through Mauritius, which is a tax seven country, Singapore and Hong Kong. The biggest example is Alibaba, Alibaba's investment Paytm. This comes from Ali, Singapore holdings of Alibaba. This does not reflect in the $4.5 billion. So according to one estimate from the Economic Times that out of 50 billion FDI received in, in, in uh, 2019, one fourth to one fifth of FDI comes from China or Chinese origin farm. They, they, so there is they, 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 they no excuse that we can avoid Chinese investment unless we uh, discuss the FDI investment here. And since I was saying the Chinese investment and Chinese FDI do not represent the true extent of investment in India, we have to also look into the Chinese business reach in India. Without Chinese business reach, we cannot clearly look into the Chinese FDI investment to India. So roughly around, we have 800 companies which are operating in India. And out of these 800 companies, remember 75 companies are manufacturing facilities for smartphone, consumer appliances, even construction equipments like art mover, power gear, automobiles, optical fibers, and chemicals. So these are the, the, these, these firms, 800 have the have presence in India. Out of 75, are directly in terms of manufacturing. Now, all of you know Chinese have huge presence in the startup of India. All well-known startups in India, starting from Big Basket, Baiju, Flipkart, Make My Trip, or Ola, Oyo, the hotel thing, Paytm, Policy Bazaar, whatever the, the uh, startups of last five years, you remember. There has been massive Chinese investment in this startup, and this amount in 2014-18-19 was in four billion dollar. Remember, I was saying that soon after uh, Prime Minister Modi came in power, the Chinese FDI and Chinese trade uh, surplus, Chinese import, everything have increased. Everything has increased in significantly, and most of them have come to this uh, startup. And startup alone contributed around four billion dollar in uh, FDI from China. The most significant mobile phone brand is a smartphone brand, Xiaomi, Vivo, Oppo. This contributes around 60% of India's uh, smartphone shipment from China. The other two are recently banned app like TikTok, UC Browser. They, max, they, they have been maximum downloaded only in India. So without understanding this startup and technology business or technology investment by China, we cannot fully understand the Chinese presence to the Indian economy. Now, since I was saying about the success of India's pharmaceutical sector, the three sectors which, uh, uh, which India can always show as a success of liberalization or privatization. One is about this pharmaceutical sector. Second was mobile, te mobile telecom. And third, uh, third sector was the aviation sector. Now, for various reasons, in recent times, both aviation sector as well as the mobile telephone sector, they are suffering some problem. But only one problem which has overcome all, all types of uh, domestic as well as international problem is the pharmaceutical sector. So India it is now at present is the third largest producer of uh, drugs and medicine. 
it is largest largest exporter of the generic drugs but the but, but this is one of the sad story that the india is the largest producer and largest exporter of exporter of the exporter of generic drugs but most of the doctors in india they do not subscribe or they do not prescribe the generic drugs as a consumer the same generic drugs with prices 10 to 30 times lower than the branded drugs gone to, uh, for export market and and as i was saying earlier that two third of all drug and pharmaceutical uh, raw materials and ingredients come from china so without without the import of chinese uh, drug and uh, chinese pharmaceutical raw materials this sector could not have achieved its success what it has achieved in in, in today's context so and in and i was reading one report that in 2018 uh, 19 itself the pharmaceutical sector in india has imported around 18 billion dollar drug in uh, drug inputs from china so, so if you remember the whole trade scenario of india china around 70 billion dollar is uh, import from china out of that 70 billion dollar only 18 billion comes to the pharmaceutical sector so success of pharmaceutical sector is conditioned upon the uh, cheap and speedy flow of import from the china now <clears throat> while i was saying the trade the another part of trade is the people's movement this people's movement also brings uh, culture of the two countries very close in 2017 18 almost 8 lakh indian visited china and in visa wise comparison to china only we have received 3 lakh chinese tourists so earlier i was saying that china is importing sorry india is importing five times more than what it is exporting to china now in tourism sector also india is sending three, three times more tourists to china than the chinese tourists coming to india as a consequence of this this tourism market in india which is around 80 billion dollar the chinese the the, the country wise spend on the india tourism sector if you consider china it is less than 1 billion dollar spend in indian tourism market so here also we are draining out of our foreign exchange reserve through uh, growing one way tourism from india to china so these are the some of the uh, 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 important trade and invest trade investment and in, uh, business dimensions of china and investment uh, china and india which i am uh, sharing here <coughs> okay so uh, i'll stop here i think uh, 15 minutes time i took any uh, question answer Thank you, Dr. Prashanu Pradhan. It was a very illuminating speech, and uh, I have posted in the chat box uh, to ask questions for you. And so there's one uh, question uh, from Dr. Paramita Dash. Do you think this prosperous trade relations will be continued in the post-COVID era? Not only post-COVID era, but also post-Dalwan conflict, this prosperous trade relation will not continue. This is not at all a prosperous trade relation for India, except the pharmaceutical sector. The rest of the Indian sector is uh, uh, dominated by the Chinese import. so for example the mobile phone appliances this uh, uh, headphone or even charger these are less than 10 rupee 15 rupee cost in china but here we are uh, buying those same thing at a 200 500 or 1000 rupee uh, price so because of this massive chinese import in this sector india is not only losing employment but also losing its foreign exchange reserve So it is time that soon after this post-COVID and soon after this uh, Galwan Galwan episode, this uh, the, this the not prosperous. This is actually a, uh, disheartening to the India's interest. There is such a one-sided trade relation. And today, one article came in Indian Express by uh, one uh, Nitya Bilay Debroy. He was very categorical, categorical explaining in 
entire trade dimension from China, between India and China has been one sided. India has been always exporting the primary producers, and China has restricted the India's export of manufacturing and other exports to China. So China does not allow the access uh, of its market to foreign company. So India can export many many uh, pharmaceutical many many pharmaceuticals uh, uh, products to China, but China has restricted the access. So that is one of the reason that India should be very careful about the continuing this uh, trade relationship with China and especially such a large trade deficit with China. Yes, it is not clear to me. Okay, so uh, uh, that is what the, uh, this uh, both the COVID episode and the uh, Galwan episode is a wake up call. We have to restrict the Chinese import uh, import from China in major sectors. Hello, America. Sector. Hello. Hello. Papiya, to mute for now. Amit, Amit, Amrita, should the passage. Amit, please mute Papiya, please. I, I, actually, the, I, I, actually, actually, the problem is that uh, uh, maybe, uh, the, hello, problem is that the, uh, uh, Dr. Pradhan is uh, sharing the screen. If you can uh, stop sharing, then I can uh, do the other other things. Dr. Pradhan, please uh, stop sharing your screen. I think your presentation is over, okay. so that I can do other. other things. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Please, please, please carry on, sir. Please carry on. Sir. <clears throat> yeah, that is what I was saying there. After after COVID and Galwan incident, it, uh, the weakness of Indian economy exposed to the, the Chinese import. The many uh, many uh, manufacturing items which can be easily made in India without much skill and much technology. I was giving the example of mobile phone, mobile phone charger, the mobile for the, this headphone, and uh, all other electrical appliances easily can be made at a cheap uh, cheap cost. But since uh, we have it, uh, since the trend has continued uh, uh, from 2020, 2012 and 13, there has been no wake up call to stop such Chinese import to India. So except I think the pharmaceutical sector, there is no other sector where Ch uh, Chinese dependence is essential. We can get rid of Chinese uh, Chinese dependence, dependence other than the pharmaceutical sector. Uh there's uh, another question from Pakto Sharathi Bera. He wants to know your source of data. DGCI, Director General of Commercial Intelligence. And for international data, it is the uh, World Bank. OK, thank you. So are there any more questions? Uh, if uh, actually, I'm uh, seeing a lot of uh, comments that it's a very informative session and it's a very nice session, both in the YouTube uh, channel and here, but uh, I don't find any more questions. So if anybody ha has any more questions, uh, they can ask or I'll uh, just uh, thank Dr. Pradhan and uh, finish this session. Thank you, madam. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pradhan. So uh, we really had very good, two, two very good sessions and yours was really very informative and I'll go through the YouTube channel once again to actually fully listen to the um, to your speech because I was looking at the chat box at the same time and I'm not very good at multitasking. Anyway, so anyway, thank you very much. So uh, now we have uh, uh, come towards the end of our webinar. So I'll request uh, Dr. Devkumar Chakraborty, Head of the Department of Economics, Ramakrishna Mission, Vidya Mandira, Bellur, to do the of the web. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello. Sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. So, okay, okay. So let me at first express my thanks to Vijay Krishna Girls College for organizing such an interesting seminar. In fact, 
participation from our part was only only ornamental just giving the consent now thanks to the speakers for their for illuminating us with their views in fact they are live lines of every seminars now rumadi started with the quotation that we are turning to a new era which was defined as a new normal by rupkatha now in at this juncture it is our concern to know what is going to happen next now uh, professor nandi stressed that it is in fact an opportunity at this juncture we should look at how to train our students what type of skills should they be given to sustain <coughs> the environment uh, so to sustain the business as the environment of the business is changing over time and how should they prepare themselves for certain changes in the future now the first thing she said was that when one starts a business they should think about all the stakeholders including the society as a whole now at the same time they should think about innovativeness in fact often a small business can bring about big changes in the society it should be complemented by equal opportunities for both sexes concerns for environment now at the same time we should also look about the mental well being of the stakeholders including the society she also mentioned certain roles of government that can play a complementary role in this regard for the students she emphasized on developing a mentality to help the weaker and elderly sections of population as it would create the base for planning their social responsibilities when they become entrepreneurs or managers of certain corporations now <clears throat> the covid was accompanied in india by a threat from china this made us to rethink about the indo china re relationship this was addressed by dr pradhan according to him china started decades earlier than india in entering the global and economic space it has made remarkable progress during that span as a result india's performance is relatively bleak amid certain successes in social and democratic level for obvious reason china's share of trade in india is much higher compared to that of india in china in fact china's export is more or less equal to india's gdp china also has invested a significant amount in india through fdi channel there has been massive chinese investment in startups two third of pharma inputs still comes from china so we should not think of a rapid withdrawal from china or chinese goods to be particular as has become a common agenda in popular culture because it is just infeasible we need to go miles with serious effects before with serious efforts before catching china so this is more or less the gist which i have uh, accumulated i again thank both the speakers as well as the college for taking such an initiative thank you thank you dr chakraborty and you really embarrassed me by saying that your role was just ornamental so if you are just an ornament then you are the jewel in the crown okay <laughs> so uh, the um, uh, feedback form has been shared in the chat box so participants may please fill up the feedback form which will enable you to get the e certificate and in the end i will request dr devjani mitro to give, give the vote of thanks and uh, uh, clear the uh, end of the webinar thank you to kathadi am i audible yeah yeah you are very much audible uh thank you uh, good evening friends uh, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a new normal way of vote of thanks 
on this occasion of one day international webinar on business and international relations in covid era i on behalf of the department of economics and iqac bijoy krishna girls college howrah extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the speakers dr Mo monomita nondi and dr krishanu pradhan for their enlightening speech on such a contemporary issue uh, it's a very pleasure for me to thank uh, both of them are my ex colleagues uh, we are from the same platform of ikpai so it is uh, my pleasure to convey my uh, thanks on behalf of my college vijay krishna girls college um, to them and then will you please mute amit will you please mute yes and on behalf of my institution vijay krishna girls college howrah i extend my most sincere thanks and namaskar to our collaborator department of economics ramkrishna mission vidyamandir belur howrah i convey my sincere thanks to dr devkumar chakraborty devkumar the hod department of economics rk mission vidyamandir for his uh, lucid explanation and also other uh, faculty members of the department uh, next uh, i must uh, convey my thanks to all of the participants both faculty members and students from different institutions who blessed us with their presence and active participation thank you very much participants i would like to express our profound gratitude and a big thank you to our ever enthusiastic principal dr ruma vattacharya who has inspired us always for organizing such types of activities thank you very much ma'am i would like to thank our beloved iqac coordinator madam dr sheta guho for her moral support guidance and regular follow ups we are very much grateful to our nac technical coordinator dr amit mojumdar associate professor department of commerce for his endless technical support and also sri shubhodeep dash sad department of electronics for his technical support i also convey my heartiest thanks to all of my beloved colleagues for their endless support and inspiration thank you very much rup katha mukherjee ji uh, my department colleague for conducting and moderating the session and guiding us in every respect last but not least a big thank you to our hod sarojit onkura sir for his active and positive support in every respect for success of this webinar thank you very much to our new member of the department uh, uh, professor shubhan pasu lecture uh, for his moral support thank you very much and with this i am concluding this session thank you very much and feedback form is already circulated in the chat box and within half an hour you have to fill the feedback form and submit this thank you and you will get certificate within a week uh, yeah uh, filling up the feedback form is mandatory yeah it is a uh, filling up both, of it is yes. both in the zoom group chat as well as in the youtube uh, live chat you can fill up this okay bye i think it's over sure uh amit wait few minutes i have to fill up the feedback form no, no. also right you can do it from anywhere yeah do it from the rupkata ji should i sign off hello no just a few a few few more minutes 
Yeah, yeah. Wait for a few ah. minutes. Okay, okay few minutes. Actually, at that time, I am also uh, giving this uh, uh, the, the link of the feedback in the YouTube channel. So the noise is actually coming. The synchronous noise is coming. No from problem, Ami. No yeah. problem. Problem. Someone yeah, I can manage. Because, no, no, no. Because I, I have to open up another window, another. Then I have to give the feedback link because I can't do it from the one window because the, yeah, the the zoom is going on. Now the machine, I have to do it. I have to run the YouTube. I mean the YouTube yeah. YouTube streaming. Ta bondo karo. Yeah. Chalche. Yeah. 